Hello people. So today we go for lesson number two. Maybe today is the same day as the other day <laughs> or the other lesson. Um, I do this as a joke but I, I record these lessons in each one in its own video and then of course you will manage you will manage your own uh, time and you will manage how many lessons you want to study in one day. I would be careful. Don't underestimate that the size of the video makes it very easy um, because the information is really dense. You might understand this when you go to the text and when you're reading the text you will probably feel a little bit challenged because there are some words or some terms that you might not really understand. So in this case, please put a comment uh, below and then, you know, maybe there's many questions about many terms and we can even at the end have some kind of glossar with all these terms and what they mean. So we can all, you know, develop a little bit, a little bit more. So don't be afraid when you find a term that you don't understand, leave it in the comments, uh, make the question. There's no stupid questions. Every question is uh, meaningful and is important. And pay attention that although the text is not too much, there's a lot of information compressed. So take your time really to listen to the video, pay attention to what you're listening to. Uh, and also when you read the text, pay attention to the text and think. So now that the warnings are done, uh, I start with uh, lesson number two, which has the title, the material body and the immaterial body. This lesson describes the first time in Western history that the problem of the body and mind was addressed. The church considered the body material and sinful and spirit immaterial and divine and such a division was accepted until the renaissance when scholars broke the clerical rules and started to investigate the body from the out within as an example of architectural embodiment reflecting this change in a cultural paradigm this lesson describes the transition from the cathedral typology to the emergence of the anatomical theater so I just make here uh, a little comment. We will have for each lesson a kind of typology of building that I take as an icon for the ideas we are discussing. For e so each lesson is dedicated to a time period from so and so. So for example, the last lesson was concerned. It started with Vitruvius and then we went through the Middle Ages, we made a little start in the Renaissance, we, we connected a little bit these times. But the icon, the focus was the cathedral, the medieval cathedral. So it's very important for you that you keep this image of the medieval cathedral and also that you try to imagine this, you know, re recall from your own experience. For example, here in Stuttgart, you have a wonderful example. There's this church, uh, St. Maria Alls, which uh, St. Maria, and now there's this name St. Maria Alls because we, we still didn't figure out what we do with it. Um, but for example, St. Maria, it's a wonderful example of such a building. And if you haven't visited now, <laughs> probably it's not a good time, but I'm sure most of you have visited it and you can recall the experience of being of being in such a building or other other cathedrals um, that you know uh, from Germany or from other countries for example uh, in Portugal we have, where I come from we have Mustaira del Cubasa it's a, an example uh, late Renaissance and we also have um, in England you have Westminster Abbey Another example of, of a very famous building cathedral. Of course, in Paris, you have Notre Dame. And you have also um, in um, Germany, you have the example of the Dome in Köln, 
which is also uh, an example. So it, each one of these cathedrals from the Middle Ages reflects, of course, a specific style. Uh, this is expressed in the ornament, uh, but of course there are similarities and they, uh, and they can be all recognized by following the same uh, building principles. So we move now from from this icon of the typology of the of the cathedral to the typology of the anatomical anatomical theater i will give you as complementary to this information i will give you also uh, i will leave it on moodle um, general information about about as a building typology what describes each one of these buildings so so you can also use it, you should use it to, to complement the information you get here from the text and also to be able, you know, to, uh, to understand what, exa what exactly are the characteristics that make, um, that make the, building, the building typology of, of, for example, a cathedral and then anatomical theater and so on. So, lesson two, the title again. The material body and the immaterial body. We start with the Renaissance. Universities during the Renaissance were competitive loci of knowledge, much more released from the tight influence of the church, as sponsorship would come from other sources such, such as the emerging middle class and its influential families, eager to sponsor such investigations as a strategy to affirm and display their power. Of course, one has to recall examples such as the Medici, Medici's or the Borgias, in the last case intrinsically connected to the church as well. Such families supported through patronage many of the emerging artists of the Renaissance and contributed to the evolution of humanism. This concept ruled the academia of the time, as the current belief was based on integrated knowledge. It was in such a context that the genius of Dürer, Alberti, Copernicus, Galileo, and many others would flourish. You can check figure 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3. We have some examples here, uh, drawings of uh, Albrecht Dürer, which reflect a canon of proportions, a very, very um, Renaissance motive, this uh, canon of proportions, and of course the study of the human body. Um, you probably already know that Albrecht Dürer was uh, the, the German, yes, one should not say the German Leonardo, but it was the German equivalent of the, of the Renaissance uh, genius. He was directly involved with the, with the Renaissance in Italy. He, he went to, through a period of study in, in Venice, where he, where he studied and where he really grew a lot and then he returned to Germany and established his, his very famous and successful workshop there. But he did have the experience of having this very strong Italian um, influence in his work. So Alberti left us beyond many other works, his own treatise in, architect in architecture, De Redificatoria, defining an architectural body for his time reaffirming the importance of classical heritage, but also leaving space for others to later expand his repertoire, like Palladio, who would do his own version of classically inspired architecture, i quattro libri di architettura. I just make a stop here. These three books, which directly address the topic of the human body and architecture, are fundamental for the study for study and for understanding architectural history. And they are from Vitruvius, 10 books on architecture, Alberti, De Reedificatoria, and Palladio, I Quattro Libri dell'Architettura. These three treatises of architecture set the standard at the time. Of course, a standard also has problems because from the moment we build the standard, it means that we have the rules for, bu for building, we tell uh, wo what is the canon that has to be uh, followed and so on and so on. So for whatever canon that was established, there were always people who were coming and breaking the rules. 
But in any case, the rules are important because the rules transport traditions, tra traditions of building, traditions of, of thinking, and also the architectural repertoire of forms and how uh, form and meaning is represented through space and through building. And of course, how this expresses the, the thought of, of or the people or the, or the country or the culture that um, commissions the building and how the people live, most importantly. So these thoughts, these programs, these ideas, condition how the people live and how the people uh, think. And they conditioned, of course, the architecture of, of their time and, and of the future. So Alberti's most important legacy regarding this discussion we are having about the body in architecture, going through architectural history with the focus of the body, is related to Alberti's notion of consinitas, what Immanuel Kant would later address as purposiveness. Taking Alberti as one of the most important examples, the Renaissance man wasn't a slave of specialization as the modern man would become, but an ever-growing individual whose curiosity could be fed by the contact with many areas of knowledge such as philosophy, mathematics, geometry, astronomy and anatomy. This doesn't seem very distant from, distant from the Middle Ages approach to the topic of the body, but the fundamental difference comes exactly in the influence of new technologies using these investigations and more importantly, a hands-on, practical, embodied approach which anchored knowledge in concrete reality and not only metaphysical exploration. So the authors of the Renaissance, Alberti for example, they were also very involved in, in building itself. They weren't just writing about architecture, they were practicing and they were, um, they knew from experience about the art of building. So they were setting these rules. Of course, they were reviewing the architectural history and so on, but they were directly involved in the art of building, which is a knowledge in itself. Please check for uh, images. Please check uh, 2.4, 2.5 and 2.6. You have here, similarly as the images we saw before from Leonardo da Vinci and then Cesare Cesariano and also Albrecht Dura, we have here a collection from, um, from Leon Battista Alberti, so the one who I just mentioned before. And you have here the representation of, representation of the human body, a representation of a column and an architrave and a tablature based on uh, the proportions of the human body and another proportion study of the human body. So in the Renaissance, science was based on evidence coming as the result of concrete experimentation. Here it's also important to pin down that the tools of the time, logically, allowed the expansion of the consciousness of what it meant to be human. And this search continued, as this search continued, more effort was necessary to produce tools which would allow one to see deeper. As a consequence, the study of anatomy wasn't done differently by artists and scientists, but by the end of the 16th century, anatomy's importance had grown enough to make it a discipline in its own right, although intrinsically related to med medicine. This was also the dawn of rationalistic thinking and again announcing a paradigm change. The holistic body of the Renaissance, which integrated body, mind and soul, represented by anthropomorphic architecture based on its proportions, evolved to a body of empirical science. It's also important to note that the Renaissance predecessors were interested in the anatomy of both the living and the dead body, probably without making a distinction between them, as we can infer by Leonardo's machine drawings. Uh, please check 2.7, 2.8 and 2.9. We have here a collection of, a collection of drawings. Of course, this is de debatable. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci 
he did many studies on uh, on the human body based based on dissection so an, an anatomical studies but most of his studies were done by the observation of live bodies how how the bodies were living um, we can't also ignore that some of Leonardo's speculations on the role of the human brain as the main controller of the body, which includes motions, emotions, were very important to establish his own specific vocabulary, vocabulary of signs and representation in painting. Quoting, we had it already in the last lesson, but we hear it again. The most important task of the artist is to represent through the subject's body what goes on in their minds. Here in turn we can also refer to Leonardo's anatomical studies of skulls, which recall the Pantheon's dome and its importance as a symbol of the emperor and its illuminated mind, made eternal through stone. One can also understand that Leonardo's machines intended to make possible to extend human capacities and their, make their dreams, such as flying, come through. Originally, uh, if you want to check for uh, Leonardo's uh, flying machines, please take a look at figure 2.10. Originally, movement and proportion, body and mind, were intrinsically related in the study of the humanist body. And it was probably after Andreas Vesalius the Humani Corporis Fabrica, publishing, that anatomy grew definitely as a science in itself, devoted to the study of the human body. By the 17th century, universities were established all over Europe, and it was important to affirm each one of them as the best sources of knowledge. Of course, medicine established itself as one of the main areas of interest and prestige, and as the historical custom a new typology of building had to serve the purpose of the time. Science, and particularly medicine, transformed dissection into a ritual which should be performed for a very specific and selected audience, and as a consequence, a new space for hosting such academic events was necessary. This was how the anatomical theatre was created, a place to exhibit the human body to curious and eager for knowledge minds and still today, this is one of the main parts of a student's of medicine's initial curriculum. So to refer to the anatomical theater, please take a look at figures 2.11 and 2.12. I will turn this here. And you can see here, this typology of building is extremely interesting because it's done it looks a little bit like a Colosseum, and it has this uh, circular shape with, of course, there's, there's a table here where the body lies and it follows this um, idea of, um, every, that, uh, of uh, you, I did not mention the um, Elizabethan theatre, but that was the theatre from Shakespeare time uh, in London that also had this kind of spherical uh, floor plan and uh, so that it could be seen from a different different sides and this is exactly the same situation in the anatomical theater it was made so that this body which was there on display could be open and could be seen around uh, by everyone who was there interestingly enough many anatomical uh, theaters had uh, benches to sit and also had like uh, walls where people could lean to because often they got very very sick while while watching these uh, dissections and every student of medicine knows that this is a kind of trial trial of initiation that you you go through this stage until you just don't get sick anymore so the anatomical theater was was created following some of these uh, some of these uh, specifications um, but most of all, it's really a reference to the theater, and it has this name as a, as a theater, exactly because there is a body which is in display, on display. So there is something which is presented, and it's on display in a table. And this also, of course, also has a meaning and eventually references to, um, to ritual 
into this kind of uh, very respectful ceremonial um, performance that happens when a body is on display for a community of scientists uh, to observe and then someone performs this um, dissection. One must take in consideration that the 17th century brought the dawn of the scientific method, which was defined as a method or procedure that has characterized natural science consisting in the systematic observation, measurement and experiment, as well as the formulation, testing and modification of hypotheses. One clear example can be found on Descartes' Le Discours de la Méthode. Divide each difficulty into as many parts as is feasibly and necessary to resolve it. Naturally, one must recognize the virtues of such a litany, but looking at Descartes' philosophical work, specifically having in consideration that the matters of body, mind and soul and emotions were treated extensively, one might draw a parallel and suspect that the body cut into infinitesimal parts and exposed in the dissection table might have solved at the time some mystery regarding the, working, the inner workings of the body itself, but did not reveal the workings of its mind and soul. The body was a problem that could not be solved by the study of its parts. So we were talking about the Renaissance and then we arrived at the 17th century and um, and we make this connection because of the scientific method, which of course was very uh, connected to Descartes, for example, I was also working in between different uh, disciplines, philosophy. Um, but a lot of uh, Descartes philosophical problems address exactly the question of perception and address the question of the human body. So Descartes worked a lot on the topic of, of uh, vision and uh, the topic of perception. And these developments, of course, were also, uh, this kind of thinking was also applied in the field, in the field of architecture. Uh, and the scientific method, this solving a problem by finding you know, dis dissecting, like in the dissection table, finding its infinitesimal components and analyzing, analyzing it by its parts, of course, has advantages because it makes the the searching and the understanding of of the of the problem somehow easily. But it leads to a um, situation where at some point we lose track of the whole. But we will arrive to this uh, later. So this problem of separating things by its parts, and in the case of Descartes, separate body and mind, is addressed as dualism. So before we talk about dualism, I would just like you to take a look at figures 2.13, 2.14 and 2.15 where you have uh, illustrations from, uh, again, a di dissection table now from the 16th century and also from the 16th century, two um, anatomical drawings by Andreas Vesalius from De Humani Corporis Fabrica. De Humani Corporis Fabrica means in Latin on the fabrication of the human body. And in this case, fabrication comes from the Latin and it has the meaning of uh, also of construction, how the, how the human body is fabricated, is uh, constructed. So you can see here, for example, but in your PDFs you can, you can look at them uh, better. And uh, I would also like you to take a look, because we spoke about the 17th century, so you can compare from the image. I have these images here for you because most of all the images complement the text for you to, to have a kind of, since we are doing this in this storytelling way, so that when you hear the text and when you look at the images, you have a little bit this 
almost like a filmic experience that you can get the mood of the of the image or get the mood of the painting and connect it with the ideas and the images that ca that come to your mind through the texts so it's it's not so much that the images are directly you know illustrating a specific thing of the text it's more that they are evocative of this kind of mental of of landscape of of the topics we are talking about so for example two two points figure 2.16 please take a look this is um this is a, a painting by rembrandt and it's the anatomy lesson of uh, nicolas Taube from also from the 17th century and it's a very famous uh painting and you see here the body the dead body open on the dissection table and of course the, the scientists very interested in seeing uh, and understanding the workings of the body so now we arrived at Descartes and with Descartes we arrived at the topic of dualism which will be dualism will be treated a little bit more deep in the next lesson but we start now for now we make notice that again we are talking Descartes 17th century a new paradigm needed to be established and as usual only technological pro progress could promise advancements in this field it would still take some time to happen the architecture of the 17th century or what historically was named as Baroque was influenced by this awareness of the flesh and so the material body of the archi of architecture gave form to the immaterial spirit of god and nature mostly inspired by the mathematical findings of leibniz who being also a philosopher called attention again to the issue of proportion relating it to harmonic musical scales and the notion of infinite space so now we are talking about baroque architecture it's important to note borromini and bernini two most important baroque italian baroque uh, architects who followed michelangelo's architectural legacy as the most prominent architects of this time and both very well versed in geometry their buildings express a true corporeality in the sense that they sensually transmit to the dweller very strong emotions conducting their way in a crescendo towards the sublime so this idea of the sublime of course it's, it's a baroque idea and you have here please take a look at figure 2.17 uh, it's a fresco of the dome of the church of saint agnes in agony uh, in rome by ciro ferri and you have here the complete celestial cabaret uh, replic with angels flying up to the oculus replicated to infinity exactly giving this idea of movement ornamentation sensuous delight so the baroque architecture really wanted to give this uh, very fleshy very body sensorial um, experience it is an architecture that is made to host the god incarnate made flesh in the wounded christ who is exposed not in a dissection table but over an altar reaching towards the sky his father the maker surrounding the main the main nave space multiplies through illusionary paintings chapels and sub chapels radiate from side naves and a complex play of convex and concave shapes adds more mystery through a calculated mastery of light and shadow these are characteristics of baroque architecture the line between reality and virtuality material and immaterial is blurred in the baroque house of the god made flesh cabinets containing relics of martyrs and saints contribute as immortally preserved testimonies of the religious narrative contributing to the visitor's experience by triggering his empathy towards the passion of christ and his followers but strangely reminding us of the anatomical specimens saved as trophies in the medicine schools museums as examples of best achievements in such style of architecture 
we can take two examples. Borromini's San Carlo alla Quattro Fontane in Rome, in particular the facade, and Bernini's Piazza and Colonnades, which lead to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. So to take a look at uh, these two examples, so the facade of the church San Carlo alla Quattro Fontane and um, the section of San Carlo alla Quattro Fontane, please check a, take a look at figures 2.18 and 2.19. Both of these buildings were dedicated, of course, to represent and express the Catholic narrative. These pieces represent the excellence of Roman Baroque, but also its excess and deliberate desire to arouse mystical experiences and guide the feelings of the followers towards the physical perception of the sublime by the stimulation of their senses. In Catholic Rome, the subjective experience of faith happens in a place where the sense of community embraces differences of age, gender or social hierarchy, leading to a vision of the body as a collective locus of passion. Once again, philosophy and religion try to give answers to the questions left open in the dissection table of the anatomical theater. So please check figure 2.20. Uh, we have uh, from Bernini also the colonnade of St. Peter's Square uh, in Rome. Perhaps some of you have already visited Rome and have uh, visited the, the colonnade. Uh, you also probably also know from the Pope announcements and so this is a place which is often uh, filmed and photographed and uh, was used also as setting setting for um, different uh, film productions uh, and um, and I will also give you in the in the texts I will also give you detailed information about this building because uh, and the square because of course it's uh, important for you to understand not only not only the building itself but also in this case how um, baroque architecture also had this uh, agenda expresses agenda in terms of urban design and what it means in an urban context to design such a large scale monumental colonnade like this which exactly has this kind of shape which looks like an embrace and it's something that physically the community feels embraced by this this kind of um, uh, gesture that the, that the colonnade makes of, of embracing the people in this um, community. So the mind and soul of the body were still regarding, uh, perhaps I just show here because I didn't show it before, just to give you a little bit this feeling I told you before with this uh, sensation, sensation of embrace. So I, I make another stop here because I think it's important for you. Probably you were never really used to learning architectural history from this point of view of, of, of the experience of architecture. So at this moment I'm recording the videos and I'm also thinking how will they receive this? I mean, where are all the facts? Of course, these are facts and you will get all the facts about the buildings and about the plans and about what they mean. Um, but this is really a good opportunity for you to think about, you know, what the shape of the building and, and how the building, you know, is um, how the parts of the building fit together and especially how how while experiencing the building, because a building always makes make us move, it moves us. Even when we look at it, you know, our eyes, there's a philosopher called Merleau-Ponty who writes about experience. And Merleau-Ponty says, the eyes want to touch and the hand wants to see. And he does this in the context of perception. And what it means. Why do I make this connection? I make this connection because when we look at a building or anything else, but we are talking about building because this is history of architecture. When we look at a building, even if we are not consciously thinking about it, our minds and our bodies are already making sense 
how am I how am I going to use this building? What am I supposed to do with this building? How will my body behave? And somehow, of course, most of our actions are learned. We can also, you know, act like Borat and be completely clueless and enter a church and sit on the altar and do all the things that we should not do, for example. <laughs> that's, that's one possibility. Um, but the, if, if a building has certain qualities, and if it's a really good building, especially, it will make you behave in a certain way, even if you're really, really clueless. And this happens because of scale. It happens because of how the parts are built together. And it happens because we, as humans, we have a capacity which is called empathy. And we will go through empathy, empathy theory a little bit later. But I already make this as a kind of introduction. Empathy in this context doesn't mean only my friend is sad and because I'm not a psychopath, I feel how my friend is feeling and so I feel sad too. Or my girlfriend is eating this really nice ice cream and I think that she really likes it. Maybe I, maybe I would also like it and I, I, I want to try. For example, this, this is one case of empathy. Or for example, hanging in, looking at Facebook nowadays and seeing you know all, all the news of the people in Italy and everywhere else who got sick with Corona, for example, and, the, and then feeling really sorry for them. Of course, this is a feeling of compassion and so, but this happens because we humans have this capacity of empathy. And this is empathy, you know, in, a, in, a, in an emotional level, but our emotions in the world, how we move, what we look at and so, all our movements, they are connected to our emotions, to how we react to stimuli from the environment. And of course, the built environment, you know, whether if it's a chair or a room or a building or a city, everything which is built and has a form and exists in the material world, even in the immaterial world, but we are just talking about the material world, all of these things trigger reactions in us. And then we are always computing what we do, what we do, what we do. This is also called affordances, but we will not go to affordances, but I just wanted to tell you to make you curious. Empathy. So what happens when I visit, for example, a Baroque church or before I enter a Baroque church? I look at this facade from Bernini and the facade has this curved surface. Of course, I don't approach and I don't feel and I don't interpret this curved surface as I would interpret a flat surface from a Renaissance church. My body feels very differently about it because all of a sudden there's no clear display like in the Renaissance there's light and shade and there's a complexity that my eyes first see and then my body also wants to make this gesture and my body will do and make this dance. And that was the idea of Baroque architecture, that you visit these buildings and you join in the dance and you kind of understand how through all these golden tableau and illusions of repli uh, angels replicating, going through an oculus where the li light shines through, all this sensuous, excessive uh, bliss. And this happens because we have this capacity of, of empathy. So basically, this is one example to tell you that whatever you do in the environment, wherever you are, we are always being told what to do because the space tells us to. And we learn, we also learn by how others behave and we learn if someone tells us, oh, you know, you're not supposed to sit there 
or uh, and so that's that's how we navigate i just wanted to make here this little stop because i think it was important for you to have a kind of understanding so now we return to storytelling of architectural history from the point of view of experience so the mind and soul of the body we are talking about the baroque were still regarded as immaterial and close to the divine and eternal life and its flesh close to death and sin perishable yet sentient the material body should be transformed and dignified through faith perhaps corporeal punishment as Descartes himself radically proposes in his time still the interest in the topic of emotion as a consequence of sensual excitement characterizes most of the artistic body of work produced during the Baroque period, also outside of architecture. These were the times of great performances displayed in public spaces of fireworks and other sensory delights like spices and oriental scents. It is important to note that except from Peru, who studied medicine and biology before starting to work as an architect, most artists at the time had a perspective on human dissections, which was much closer to the tradition of Renaissance humanism than Enlightenment scientific rationalism. Please take a look at figure 2.21 and 2.22. This is a figure from figures from Claude Perrault, uh, drawing of a hedgehog. So Perrault was a scientist from the uh, from, from the 17th century and like i mentioned before he became an architect but before he was studying uh, he was studying um, uh, nature and uh, biology and he was also uh, interested in philosophy art is of course the field of excellence in what concerns the experience of transmitting or creating emotions so it's no wonder that Baroque architects, painters, sculptors, and musicians could transmit more about the relationship between body, soul, and emotional expression than the evidences found on the dead corpses lying on the dissection table. But this would also change in time. As an example of the Baroque's intensive search for the sublime, we can recall now Bernini's finest piece of sculpture the Ecstasy of St. Teresa. This sculpture is dedicated to St. Teresa d'Avila, who was a mystical and founder of the Order of the Discalced Carmelites. St. Teresa would later become the first female doctor of the church in, seven, in 1970. So to take a look at uh, the Ecstasy of St. Teresa, which is a very, very fine uh, sculpture, please take a look at figure 2.23, 2.24, and 2.25. Saint Teresa describes in her notes about meditation a very detailed encounter with an angel who pierced her repeatedly through her heart until she was filled with such a strong fire which she interpreted as the love of God. The actual description is so sensuous that it is impossible for the reader not to think immediately of an erotic and very real sexual experience. It is affirmed by specialists in Eastern traditions of Buddhism, for example, that meditation can alter one's perception. It's also verified fact that in other cultures, mystical trances can induce altered states of consciousness that might resemble those of an orgasm for an outside viewer. And this is exactly the scene that Bernini polemically represented with this sculpture. So it was really a bold move of Berlin, Bernini to, to produce a very explicit image like this, but it did fit absolutely with this idea of the sublime and of rapture and of complete uh, embodied abandonment to the love of God. Bernini's sculpture embodies exactly an encounter between the human and the divine, the body and the spirit. There, the somatic body is shown as the medium to transmit this intense encounter. 
Another example of an erotically charged sculpture dedicated to a religious topic during the Baroque is the one representing the death of blessed Ludovic Albertoni, also by Bernini. Here, death is portrayed as another rather sensually explicit moment of mystical communion with God. So for blessed Ludovic Albertoni on, uh, on her death uh, bed, please take a look at figure 2.26 and 2.27, where you have very similarly to the ecstasy of Saint Teresa, you have also um, you have also this uh, baroque, obviously baroque uh, tableau, and pay attention that in both pictures, what do we see? We see bodies which are which are contorting in movement. They they almost come alive through their expression, and you see the drapery. How, how the the garments how they are wearing how carved they are and how much how much uh, light and shade and plasticity and emotion is is transmitted and of course all of this makes the figure very lively so libendi and we feel this with our bodies so we see it in sculpture and we see it also in architectural uh, space and obviously this was very intelligent uh, from 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 the artist and of course from from the church from the commissioners because the whole space becomes really moving and the more moving are the means you use to tell a story in this case stories of figures of the church the more compelling they are and if the more compelling they are the more people are interested in so in many ways this is how marketing also works um you can make i i make this comment now a little bit uh provocative of course but there is definitely a component of of uh showing presenting an idea and uh, making this idea not just visible but turning this idea into an experience for the people who meet the art, who visit the art, and who experience who experience the art. So if you look at the images, and really take your time, take your time here with, with all images. Don't, don't go through the images like, because you know, all these images were very carefully selected. Take your time looking at the images and seeing and feeling what, what these images tell you. Not just about the shape, you know, the, the, the outline and so, but really not, not also analyzing everything in detail, but really emotionally to, to try to feel, to feel the image of, of the buildings, but also especially of these uh, two sculptures. Uh, and then compare what we saw before, the drawings of the, you know, the body, the body of the Middle Ages, how was the body of the Middle Ages in comparison with, with this body which is represented here? And how, how was the cathedral in the Middle Ages, you know, formally, the arrangement of the elements, the ornaments or no ornaments, how the figures were represented? It was much more geometrical, much, much more clear. There were a lot of uh, allusions to... Um, um, of course elements of uh, nature and so but they were much more geometric and also much more abstract and not so detailed then in the renaissance what happened in the renaissance we have we have these very clear facades with extremely clear geometries like like uh, rep fine renaissance representational drawing almost like a picture or a postcard we enter a renaissance church and we have these very orchestrated views with with tableaus where where you see from one point like a camera you see everything clearly there's a, a clear a definite use of perspective and of perspective illusion to make your eye go in a specific direction so this was how the architects of the renaissance were telling you what to do and telling you where to look at and so while walking there you do 
what the space tells you to do because that's how it works and how does it work now ah, and the figures how are the figures in the renaissance how is the renaissance body the renaissance body is a body that has in the middle ages the middle aged body is, is a body of pain it's uh, slim and contorted and perhaps hungry and um, suffering the body of the renaissance a, a strong body athletic body a body with a lot of um, with a, the perfect ideal proportions uh, vital but also somehow petrified and static and then we arrive now to the baroque and what happened in the baroque what is the difference between renaissance building and in baroque everything starts moving the space moves the bodies move there's optical illusions everywhere there's light coming from the top and from the sides and from different sources but also very specifically focused but at the same time when you move through the space when you're being moved through the space and you discover in between the strong lights and the strong shades you're surprised you find you walk through a baroque church and then all of a sudden you find a niche and there's a relic in that niche and you, maybe the encounter with a relic might not be very pleasant maybe that relic is it's a skull or it's a bone or it's something that was saved collected from from a saint or or from um, some someone who who was preserved as a living testimony of of of, of this uh, community uh, and you have this very strong emotional encounter and this encounter happens in these niches in the dark and then in the middle of the dark maybe these relics are preserved in a custom-made container which is with gold leaf making it sure that it's precious and it's uh, safe and um, and, and that it's something really um, important to keep and to preserve but also not to touch like a treasure so the baroque church really uh, has this really strong dramatic dramatic uh, quality um, and also uh, highly theatrical there's there's uh, of course this uh, component And so that was the end of chapter two. We end with this idea of theater. And I will give you a little bit more information about, about the Baroque uh, theater. And we can also make, make a connection with the anatomical theater because although a different kind of sensation, this idea of, of sensation of experience is somehow connected i hope you had a good time and learned with the lecture and i'm sure you will have many questions when you read the text because there's a lot of references to philosophy and to movements so for example because you know we cannot cover everything here i would make you a suggestion when you read the text and if there's a term that you don't know exactly what it means. For example, when I say enlightenment, please don't say like, oh, I, I don't know what enlightenment is. I, I just, oh, I don't know. Don't do that. If you don't know, listen to your curiosity and just use your handy, use whatever, you know, there's so many tools today. Google, go to Wikipedia. Wikipedia is not perfect. I find mistakes in Wikipedia all the time, but it gets better and better. And for this kind of things, it will really help you. So instead of being stuck or remaining ignorant, which is never a good option, or expecting that the teacher will give you all the answers. No, the teacher won't give you all the answers. Use your own critical judgment. It's also one of the challenges of what we are doing here. Follow your curiosity. And if you want to learn more, search. The videos are short, which means there is a lot of time you have for yourself, for self-studio. And I'm counting that you are using this time 
productively. So, bis nächste Mal.